Um, I'm Michelle Moog Kusa. I'm the executive director of the Bob Moog Foundation, and I'm also Bob Moog's third daughter. Um, initially, when I first started this job about 10 years ago, um, I was a little sheepish or even embarrassed that I didn't know more about technology or synthesis. Uh, but actually, the reason for that does spring directly from my father because he really held his career at arm's length from his children and we didn't know very much about what he was doing. He wouldn't talk about it very much and he certainly didn't try to teach us anything about um, electronic music or electronics, synthesis, all of the above. And I think the reason for that actually is that uh, he felt that his mother was rather domineering and tried very hard to direct him um, to be a concert pianist, which is what she was hoping for. She was hoping that he would become uh, akin to Liberace, who she apparently uh, was very fond of. And for those of you who know anything about my father, you can probably guess that this kind of uh, introverted, geeky guy was the furthest thing from Liberace that, that uh, one could possibly imagine. So it wasn't until my father was in his late teens that he kind of broke free of that idea. And uh, my grandmother was deeply disappointed, but my father decided that, that not to pursue becoming a concert pianist, but rather to really invest and indulge in his passion, which was electronic music, um, electronic instruments to be exact, and at that time it was uh, working on theremins. So, you know, along those lines, I think that he, he didn't want um, hit this very large career and presence that he had to overshadow what we would naturally become. So there's quite a variety of professions um, between the four Mo kids, but we definitely went our own ways. Um, so, uh, you know, my focus was very much my own. I majored in political science um, and I intended to become an attorney, but um, and work for the Environmental Protection Agency, but my life kind of took a left turn and I wound up um, marrying some from, someone from West Africa and living there and having my first child there and coming back here and starting a small business so that I could spend as much time with my children as possible. And uh, it wasn't until my father passed away that I closed that business down and took over the foundation full time. So I cannot say that I'm a technologist. I am interested in it uh, very much, but I also, during my time where I've been more immersed in electronic music and technology, um, I've also been raising two children and trying to get a uh, small but mighty foundation, uh, you know, off the ground and um, progressing with all of its programs. So that's really where my focus has been. Um, I have to say that, oh, that during that time, I have been heartened to see all the women who are involved in electronic music and technology and dive right in without any uh, fear or trepidation about it being a more male-dominated um, area of interest. And I think that ranges from um, musicians and technologists. I mean, I think there's at least one uh, woman who's producing modules out there, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Um, and of course, uh, women in technology, especially in electronic music, go go way back to Daphne Oram and Delia D uh, Derbyshire and B.B. Barron and uh, continue on through uh, Wendy Carlos and Laurie Spiegel is definitely um, a, a groundbreaking artist who you know, quietly or not so quietly delved into computer music and was quite a pioneer. Suzanne Ciani also was inspired by Don Buchla's uh, mode of synthesis and it has become her life force. Um, and this is something that both of these women did when there were less women in electronic music than there are now. Uh, so they're wonderful examples of being inspired by something and not being inhibited by any artificial boundaries that one may perceive. One of the programs of the Bob Moog Foundation is an educational program called Dr. Bob Song School. 
uh, we teach little kids about the science of sound through music and technology. The technology in this case, um, since the kids are so little, we, we teach kids at the second grade level, are a theremin and an oscilloscope. Um, about half the kids that we teach are, are little girls, and um, it's great to see kind of the playing field completely leveled in Dr. Bob's Sound School where all the kids get very engaged in what we're teaching them, and you have all these little kids, both boys and girls, getting really excited about the possibilities of sound, about uh, the parameters of sound, and um, how sound turns into music. So what we're hoping is that we're laying the groundwork for both boys and girls to get deeper into music and technology. In your interaction with these kids, do you see the boys gravitating more towards the technology or you see the same behavior from both? Or do they treat them as toys rather than technology because we're in an age where technology abounds? From what I've seen when I'm in the classroom, which are some of my happiest moments because I love seeing our curriculum kind of come alive through the kids, is that uh, boys and girls are equally engaged. It's really wonderful. Um, and the way we're very careful to present the technology in a way that's accessible. It's one of the reasons we use the theremin um, because it is so engaging and because it is not an interface full of, pan of uh, knobs and switches um, with weird words on it that pe you know little kids don't know what they mean. It's, uh, it's the air and two antenna and they really um, are very uninhibited about exploring that space. And you know, there, there have been people who have encouraged me to bring synthesizers into the school at second grade. But what we have learned over the past six years of this program is that would not help lay the very basics of, of what we're trying to teach. So we have, we have um, intentionally designed and made an effort to, to bring the kids something that they can relate to immediately. And because of that, to answer your question, uh, there's an equal interest in the technology because it's accessible to, to kids of their age. Have you interacted with older children, teenagers, maybe young adults in this journey? We have. Um, occasionally we'll be out at different music events and the public will be there, so there'll be a variety of ages of kids and um, just last year we started giving two different kinds of camps and one of them was the science of synthesis um, and we did get an older um, age group there but I, I will say that's when you begin to see the divide among the genders because there were no girls in that class unfortunately um, and, and again this is something we're trying to break that mold or that boundary for girls by setting, you know, making sound and science and even synthesis more accessible from a very young age. Something that's fun and a realm for expansive discovery rather than something that's viewed as kind of like divisive a almost. Like a boys only land. Right. Sometimes I wonder if there is a sticker on every synthesizer <laughs> with men, size, small to extra large. So what do you think is the problem here? After all these years, we still see the same scenario. Is it something we should deal with in school, at home, with our parents? I think it's a complicated answer. I think that, you know, A, it could be a natural aptitude. Perhaps that, in general, Boys have a gen uh, natural aptitude towards synthesis, towards knobs and switches. Um, it, it could also be environmental. That's the way that the, um, they're kind of geared from their parents or from their very early teachers. Do you think there's an easy solution? I don't think there's an easy solution, but I think that something like Dr. Bob Song School, or there are other, not only programs, but um, products out there, like the Little Bits um, that are out there, and then I, there's a, you know, a new little toy synthesizer that's just come out um, introducing 
just the whole process of manipulating sound and and breaking it down into its individual components does make it more accessible to everybody. So I, I think that is a definite step forward. I'm a classically trained pianist as well. I try to show them it's not two different worlds, that it's a matter of transferring some of the skills and then adding others onto it. I think besides the fact that it's viewed as the male domain, there's a fear that they can't participate, I suppose. What I have found <laughs> in the experience with the foundation and interacting even with the public is that what does work the best is breaking things down into their most fundamental components, which is something that we actually focus on quite a lot. For a lay person, and I know this, this is where my actual, actually my ignorance actually serves me, um, as, a, as a lay person, having someone tell you about oscillators, envelopes, filters, amps, LFOs, your eyes just, or your brain actually, just begin to glaze over. It's a foreign language. But if you can just isolate an oscillator and introduce that as a tone generator and talk about waveforms and just talk about that parameter and maybe add one other parameter on, then it doesn't become so daunting. But otherwise, synthesis can be very daunting for someone who's first getting introduced to it, particularly A, someone who's young, and B, someone who maybe um, is so familiar with another interface, such as the piano. Um, it's a big jump. Do you, think, do you think the signs of sound should be introduced at elementary school level? It is actually introduced at the second grade level. But um, in most states, uh, the state-mandated curriculum is not particularly interactive, and that's what we're trying to change. Uh, Dr. Bob's song school comes in with something that's highly experiential, it's custom tailored to really um, engage kids in the process of discovery so that they're not only learning about sound and science um, but also they're being inspired to just think more creatively because you can do that with sound. There are many ways to think about sound and we encourage them to do that. So yes, absolutely. And I think that um, because it's something that innately we're, we're so familiar with um, that it does, it can become a gateway to becoming more engaged in science itself. But if there are young girls out there who are interested in getting into electronic music and they're looking for inspiration um, or even someone they could consider somewhat of a mentor, I might recommend one of their contemporaries, a 17-year-old named Mackenzie Barch. Um, she is a, an electronic musician who um, likes creating electronic dance music with analog synthesizers. Do you have anything you'd like to say to the young girls of today with regards to not having a fear for particularly making music with technology? Yes, I, I would say never be afraid to experiment um, with whatever you may have, whether um, it's a small synthesizer of some kind, even an app, um, or any other tools that you might have to experiment with sound. Um, I, I, you know, even any kind of musical instrument, they're all there to be played and um, it should be fun. So I would just say dive in. Don't let any fear stand in your way.